a bubble. It is a really interesting thing. It's neither a gas nor a liquid, but it is also not a solid. It needs at least two phases, or states, to exist, gaseous and liquid. We may find it everywhere in our everyday life. There is, for example, the soap foam or the mineral water. Even the tap water has bubbles. The dance of bubbles rising up in a glass of champagne may be beautiful and interesting. But is there any use for these bubbles that are always present in liquids? Just wait a bit, and everything will be clear. What happens, for example, if we start irradiating bubbles with ultrasound? Ultrasound is basically a wave of periodically changing high and low pressure zones in the air. The strength of the wave is sometimes so intense that even vacuum can be formed during the low pressure period. When a low-pressure section hits the bubble, the bubble significantly expands, growing sometimes hundredfold of its original size. The expansion of the bubble doesn't last long, since the frequency of ultrasounds usually range from 20 to 2,000 kilohertz. Up to 2 million pressure oscillations can occur in a second, so the growth of the bubble may only last for a fraction of a millisecond and the arriving high-pressure part of the wave begins to compress the bubble again. This squeezing is so forceful that the bubbles sometimes shrink to a tenth of their original size. Since the volume depends on the cube of the size, the difference between the largest and the smallest volume can be even a thousand millionfold. This process repeats itself cyclically under the influence of ultrasound. However, the duration of compression and expansion are not equal. The expansion is fairly slow, but the squeezing phase is so fast that it is sometimes called a collapse. In such cases, the gas enclosed in the bubble becomes suddenly hot, even to thousands of degrees, because the cold surrounding liquid can't cool it down fast enough. Therefore, the heat is trapped and chemical reactions can be initiated inside the bubble. This is what we call sonochemistry, chemical reactions induced by ultrasound. But what chemical and physical processes can take place in such expanding, collapsing bubbles? Due to the strong volume increase, the internal pressure of the bubble decreases. Therefore, volatile substances can enter during the expansion. Let's say, from an iron pentacarbonyl solution, a volatile iron carbonyl compound can evaporate into the bubble. After that, the molecules inside the bubble dissociate to their atoms due to the thousands of degrees of heat accompanying the collapse. Following the collapse, the temperature drops rapidly at the beginning of the next expansion phase. Due to the rapid cooling, the iron atoms don't have enough time to crystallize, so tiny, nano-sized iron particles are formed. The resulting fine iron powder has an amorphous structure with an extremely large surface compared to its volume. That's why it can be used as a highly effective catalyst. At last, the final stage of expansion is repeated, so new material evaporates into the bubble, and the cycle starts again. For what else can ultrasonic irradiation be used for in chemistry? Nanotechnology produces now a wide variety of materials. For example, cobalt, palladium, gold, or even silver, nanometals. Of course, each nanometal is produced from its own solution. Also, more complex molecules can be created from special solutions, such as molybdenum carbide, silicon oxide, titan oxide, iron oxide, or manganese oxide. Also, some very special materials have been synthesized by sonochemistry such as a fullerene, consisting of 60 carbon atoms. However, sonochemistry is a much broader field of technology. It can accelerate a lot of important industrial reactions. These are usually extremely complicated chemical processes, with thousands of compounds and tens of thousands of reactions. It would be boring to go into details here, so we just mention their starting materials and the final product. The following examples illustrate well the vast diversity of potential applications so there is no need to describe the processes in detail. Pyrazole derivatives are important in dye and pharma production. Quinoline 
is used as a preservative, solvent, and disinfectant material. Some quinoline derivatives can even destroy cancerous cells. Pyrimidine derivatives played an important part in the development of life. Many of them were found in nucleic acids, and even vitamin B1 contains a pyrimidine ring. A version of rhodonine is used to treat nerve damages of diabetic origin. Finally, the antibacterial aminophosphonates play an important role in the regulation of plant growth. Of course, there are already some well-proven technologies for the production of these compounds. But the reaction speeds can be increased by orders of magnitude with the ultrasonic method. Another advantage is that you get, almost exclusively, the desired end product from the process. And also toxic solvents can usually be avoided, by the way. But if sonochemistry is so successful in the laboratories, why hasn't it also found its way to industry? One of the biggest problems to be solved is the acoustic shielding. If bubbles are formed in a large number and densely enough, then they themselves will obstruct the deeper penetration of ultrasound into the liquid medium. To be specific, the bubbles absorb and disperse the energy of sound waves. The solution would be to find a method to create bubble clusters in a controlled way. This would keep the bubbles far enough from each other so they won't have a too large shielding effect but would still remain active chemically. The numerical solution of this problem is not easy. We have to precisely model and simulate the acoustic field, the chemical reactions inside the bubbles, and also the effects of the bubbles on the ultrasound. This could be done for a single bubble, but not for the millions in a reaction tank, where extremely complex physical and chemical processes take place. Just to increase the difficulties, the spatial dimensions are very different. A sonochemical reactor is a couple of decimeters in size. At the same time, the largest size of a bubble is around a few hundred microns, while collapsing bubbles are no more than one micron. Such a task cannot be solved directly with our current computing capacities. If modeling is so difficult, why not experiment? Well, the other big drawback of sonochemistry is the huge number of parameters. In a recent experiment, about 15 ultrasound generators were used, each with adjustable frequency and intensity. If we measure just 10 points and all possible combinations of the 30-some setting options, we get 10 to the power of 30 measurements. Let's say that a measurement takes about one hour, so our full experiment would take more than 10 to the power of 26 years. This is 200 times longer than the age of the Earth, multiplied with 10 to the 18th. Experiment-based optimization is therefore a matter of trial and error. Numerical simulations may be difficult, but this is the only way to optimize sonochemical processes and design industrial-scale technologies. The goal is not unachievable. With supercomputers and smart simplifications, the task can be made manageable. This is how we can finally achieve a green chemical industry free of hazardous substances.